I'd like to welcome to the podium Sarah Amico, Executive Chairman from Jack Cooper. Good morning. Um, I'm excited to join you all today for a look at where our industry stands and how we can best position ourselves for a bright future. Uh, I want to acknowledge my colleagues who are here, our customers, other valued partners, uh, Jack Cooper, uh, me personally, and our family are proud to be a part of this event every year, Louie, and thank you for having us. Um, you always put on a great program, but I'm particularly excited about the theme for this morning's industry outlook, which is while the sun shines. And these certainly are sunny times. Um, just look at what a great year 2015 was for automotive, generally speaking. Price Waterhouse Cooper noted that at just fewer than 17 and a half million vehicles sold, last year was a record setting high water mark for car manufacturers. And earlier this year, the Wall Street Journal predicted that 2016 will be a quote, bumper year, calling it quote, the healthiest domestic auto industry in decades. So the question becomes, what can we do with these good times to best prepare our businesses for the future? Whether those future skies are sunny, partly cloudy, or even tempestuous. In asking this question, I am reminded of one of my favorite Old Testament stories. The book of Exodus tells the story of an Egyptian pharaoh who had a dream. Seven healthy cows are grazing at a riverbank when suddenly seven thin, scrawny cows appear and eat the fat and healthy cows. Yet the scrawny ones don't gain even a pound. There's not even a sign that the fat and healthy cows ever existed. Perplexed, pharaoh called together his advisors and had the dream interpreted. The healthy cows represented seven years of prosperity, while the sickly cows represented years of famine. Seven years of prosperity were soon to be erased by seven years of famine. And like those first seven cows in Pharaoh's dreams, these are the good times. We are in the year of the fat cow. Let's see if we can get the clicker working here. One more. Well, it goes backwards, so we can always cover Louie's segment again. Well, let's see. Maybe somebody in the AV booth can help out advance these. We can also just talk. They're very pretty pictures, but the message is the same either way. Thank you. I don't know that it was worth the build-up for that, right? <laughs> so, as I said, we are in the year of the fat cow. Gas is cheap. And contrary to what Brandon said, there are a lot of us that believe that's a great thing for the economy in many ways, particularly in manufacturing. Interest rates are low, sales are up, and the labor markets are improving, however tepidly. Things are looking good. Brandon talked about 25% global growth from units in the next seven years. And while there are no skinny cows, per se, in sight, the message is still a good one for us today. In order to survive the rough times in a business we all know to be highly cyclical, you have to prepare during the good times, during the years of the fat cow. We at Jack Cooper have had our share of ups and downs over the last 88 years in the finished vehicle logistics business. Our business was founded in the year prior to Black Friday, which pushed the nation into 10 long years of the Great Depression. In the nine decades since, our industry has been shaped by countless forces within and beyond our control. From World War to Cold War, from hybrid engine technology to the rise of the shared economy. And even within our industry, a lot has changed in 88 years. One of the unique advantages of being a company that's worked for nine decades in this business is an awful lot of perspective. When Jack Cooper launched in 1928, drivers were still trying to figure out how to use traffic signals, for example. People flocked to the showroom to see the Whippet, which sold for a whopping $535. And consumers celebrated cars that came in colors other than black, thanks to the ladies. Give us color in our autos, cried the buyers. So a lot can change over time. Fat cows and skinny cows have come and gone many times in our business, and the one thing we at Jack Cooper have learned is whether it's a fat cow year or a skinny cow year, it is always a year of opportunity. 
Downturns give us the chance to eliminate bloat, to acquire new businesses, to tighten operations, and to drive innovation by way of necessity. Our experience in the downturn of 2009 certainly seems to have validated these virtues. As an industry, we suffered tremendous uncertainty, and a number of companies simply didn't make it. But for those who survived, we emerged smarter, better, and faster. That dynamic might help to explain a 2009 study, which showed that over half the Fortune 500 companies got their start during a downturn, recession, or bear market. That includes General Motors, IBM, Microsoft, AT&T, and Disney. So simply because a contraction may be on the horizon doesn't mean there isn't plenty of opportunity to be had. On the other hand, prosperous years give us the opportunity to experiment, to reduce debt, to invest in things that have a longer return cycle, and the sunny times give us the gift of time to build businesses better equipped to handle any storms ahead. To take advantage of strong years like 2016 and the market outlook that Brandon just talked about, that means we as a group and as an industry need to invest in truly long-term strategy. But what does that mean? I believe we should use these moments, while the sun still shines on the fat cows, to build business models that are truly flexible and sustainable, businesses meant to endure the next eight decades. These business models all share three characteristics, in my opinion. They are consistently innovating. So even as a 100-plus-year-old industry, I think we're doing a pretty good job of incessantly searching for new ways to capture and deliver value for our customers. Consider the work of Bill Pollack at Convertible Trailer Manufacturers, who was at the leading edge of an ingenious way to eliminate the empty miles that create outright waste in the FVL supply chain. His efforts were further buttressed by the American Trucking Association, along with many of the industry leaders seated in this room, who lobbied tirelessly to ensure a revolutionary concept to transform car haul trailers into dry freight carriers on those other empty, otherwise empty miles would become federal law in the FAST Act last December. Removing empty miles, along with their resulting costs, emissions, and extra trips on our roadways from the finished vehicle logistics network is a win for customers, a win for suppliers, a win for drivers, and a win for America's roadways. Innovation matters. Flex number two, these business models that we can create during the so-called fat cow years are those who eliminate relentlessly waste. As an industry, I think we've come a long way in this battle beyond just convertible trailers and the regulatory changes to allow our equipment to carry dry freight, car haul companies have secured legislative approval in the FAST Act to carry cars at an additional overhang length of eight feet, meaning faster and more efficient deliveries for our customers, better utilization of our drivers and equipment. And at Jack Cooper, we're driving hard to find the next way to eliminate waste and create value for our industry. Our proprietary DaVinci tool that we talked about last year, if you remember the animated video, uh, it's eliminated thousands of trips and countless in empty miles. We're using Lamasoft technology to further improve our network's efficiency. We're renewing our focus on the efficient use of fuel by our fleet. We're eliminating costs where possible and striving to delever our business. We are even experimenting with the use of drones to increase efficiency in our yards. Just because it's a fat cow year doesn't mean we need to eliminate our focus on reducing waste and inefficiency. It's just the opposite. Now is the time to double down. Lastly, businesses that are flexible and sustainable, the businesses I believe we can build and engineer now to sustain any future skies, whether they're sunny or otherwise, have a clear vision and a strong culture. Companies aren't simply propelled forward by one captain with his hands on the wheel. They are moved by an entire team, oars in hand, each doing his or her part to reach the destination. And when there is a lack of clarity about where you're going, a lack of vision, you'll find that no matter how hard some people work, you're not getting anywhere. At Jack Cooper, our vision is to build a multi-generational family company that provides our customers with high-value service, gives employees a great place to work, 
and operates based on our core values of integrity, excellence, responsibility, longevity, innovation, and imagination. One indicator of the success we've seen as a result of that strong culture is that our driver turnover rate remains largely in the single digits. We believe this is a direct result of our focus on a culture that saved us countless expenses in driver recruitment and retention. Vision and cultures matter in the good times and the bad. But we've also stubbed our toe along the way, sometimes spectacularly so. And having a strong culture means acknowledging those mistakes and doing our best to make them only once. Over the years, we've had moments where we've lost our footing, an integration or two of acquisition that proved trickier than anticipated, innovations that never quite took off the way we had anticipated. But the unique advantage of having nine decades worth of perspective is that at Jack Cooper, we believe we can always find our way back to those core values and our vision for the long term. These things not only matter, they are essential to providing our customers with the kind of service that they expect and that they deserve. And today, even as we work through some of our most recent sore toes, it is our aspiration to ensure that Jack Cooper not only endures beyond my generation, but that it does so by providing best-in-class service to our customers who have trusted us for decades. Our mission at Jack Cooper is simple, to honor our past by securing our future. We want to remain strong for the next nine decades of our company's history, and I think that's something everyone in this room can aspire to. This is the year of the fat cow, not just for Jack Cooper, but also for you, for all of us in this room. So while the sun still shines, I humbly suggest we ask ourselves, is what we are investing in today enough to sustain our industry tomorrow? It's tempting to do things the way we've always done them. Our industry is established and longstanding. But as the world moves forward, if we aren't moving with it and helping to lead it, we will be left behind. And we are part of an industry that matters. The automobile is an icon of progress a stalwart of the American economy, and a means of mobility, both literal and metaphorical. How lucky we are to be a part of an industry that touches the lives of so many people around the world. So I wasn't sure I would be here today. Uh, last weekend, my daughters and I were enjoying this glorious, sunny beach weekend in the Carolinas. Um, spirits were high, the sun was good, and then suddenly by Monday, I found myself boxed in by a tropical storm, wondering whether or not I could actually make it to California by Wednesday. It was an eerily appropriate prelude to this discussion. So my message for you today is really simple, that no matter how much the sun is shining, and certainly based on what Brandon's told us, the outlook is good. We all have good news this morning to go home and be very happy about. But no matter how much the sun is shining, we know that rougher weather will appear from time to time. Our job is to build businesses that are ready for it and keep the faith that the sun will always be there, even if it's hidden behind a few clouds from time to time. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, another great presentation that focused on the theme, the sun shining. So uh, it, it is good times at the moment. It's, it's not just that it's an upturn, but sometimes even stability is good and gives you an opportunity. Uh, but now it's, uh, it's time for your comments, questions, so the usual rules apply. Uh, if, you've got a if you've got a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone so that we can hear you clearly. Um, say your name and your company name and then you can ask the question or make the comment. We'll also be looking at the questions that are posted uh, via our app. So uh, I think precedence or preference will be given to those uh, within the room, but if you want to post a question on the app, then, then that's fine as well. So uh, perhaps I'll start off with, uh, with the first question. Um, uh, maybe to Brandon first on, on just the... The alternative fuel vehicle sales going down. Uh, that, you know, I thought that this was going to be... We, we know it isn't as growing as much as we'd like, 
but I was actually surprised that they're, that they're actually dropping. Um, are we on? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough, right? Because we've got a lot of new vehicles that are in the pipeline, mm -hmm. and um, consumer demand isn't exactly where it, it needs to be right now. We still think, as I, as I said before, uh, we don't expect there to be a huge surge in consumer demand for these vehicles, more so that you're going to add more nameplates and more options. Mm -hmm. right? We did an analysis on the, the cost premiums, and it's going down versus the non at the non-EV or the combustion vehicles. So, you know, as the cost per kilowatt hour gets down, let's say below $100 uh, per kilowatt hour, you're starting to see a little bit of parity. But also on the legislative side, that's going to be up to the government to continue those incentives, the $7,500 federal tax incentives, and I think it's even more here in California. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is what it is, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But give the industry credit, as Sarah said, you know, we're, we're planning for the future not for the present. And so the pipeline is still full of, of these vehicles coming to market, partly from a compliance standpoint, but also because that's where the industry will ultimately be, whether that's 20 or 30 years from now. Um, but we do think there will start to be a, a bit more of an uptick here in the, in the, in the not-too-distant future. Again, we've got some pretty high-profile vehicles coming to market. I wish somebody would tell me what that is because I was trying to give hints left and right. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that uh, it's something the industry just has to sort of hunker down and, and we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question from the front, please. Uh, Kirk Williams with uh, Proficient Auto Transport. Uh, Brandon, you'd said that uh, the wages in uh, Canada were $34 an hour for manufacturers and 28 in the U.S. and 6 in Mexico. What, what are the wages in uh, China, Japan, and Korea in comparison? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, Japan and Korea are considered, you know, high labor wage markets. I don't know what the exact numbers are. We could go do some digging and find out. I think the big question, I think what you're getting at, is what's, what's the variance between or the comparison between Mexico and, and China, right? So it, it is expensive to build vehicles in, in South Korea and Japan. It's, it's not so much the labor wage is one component there, but the other part of that is that those markets are relatively stagnant right now in terms of their sales environment. So there's not enough local demand to keep that going. So they need to shift capacity. China is an interesting point, and that's a number that's really difficult to get by because it's really hard to extract good data from China in a lot of cases. Um, I believe it's, it's somewhere in the ballpark of, of what Mexico is. Um, it's probably a little bit less, but then you obviously have to add the logistics cost to that. So when you think about fully loaded costs in the U.S. versus you know, importing it from China or building it in Mexico that has NAFTA, um, I think Mexico probably is still advantageous. I think the advantage for China is more so you've got critical mass in that market, particularly for the small vehicles, that you can justify that added expense because you're already building them there for local demand and can then, then export them out. It, it's a good question. Um, what we found when we did that research globally is it's, it's extremely difficult to get an apples to apples comparison of fully loaded labor costs when you take into account all the different considerations like, like insurance, premiums, health care, uh, things like that. But a good question. That, that's my sense of where those markets are at. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question for Sarah, really. Um, investing uh, while the sun shines. Uh, Traditionally, I think real innovation, investment, um, and efficiencies come when times are really tough. How easy it is, or is it, is it really possible to invest when the sun shines, or is it the time when we kind of take a break and think we can relax a little bit? We, we don't have to really just work that hard or invest that hard when, you know, here's a chance to just take a step back. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see if this is on. Sure, you could. In fact, uh, we'd probably encourage our competitors in the room to do so. Uh, so, so the answer is, uh, it's, it, it's a good question. And certainly we could kind of rest on our laurels, uh, particularly given, I think, not just the near-term forecast Brandon talked about, but really the next seven years. Uh, but I think the way that we need to think about this as an industry is we've been given a real gift. It's a cyclical industry, but that's not necessarily a negative thing in the way that we've traditionally thought about it. You've been given the gift of time to prepare your businesses for whatever contraction may come whenever that happens. And so 
you know, I do think necessity is the mother of all in, uh, invention. I, I think Uber, for example, and a lot of the companies that have come out of these massive downturns in the economy, you know, Microsoft being another great example, uh, Walt Disney Picture Studios is another example back in the Depression era. We've got some really great irons that have been forged in the fire of economic hardship. On the other hand, how wonderful would it be for all of us and for those of us on the supply side, uh, supplier side, for our customers to be able to use the good times in a similar fashion to really drive efficiency, to drive innovation, and, and I think we're getting there. I mean, it's, it's perhaps a little bit counterintuitive, but why not take all of those lessons we've learned in 2008, 2009, 2010, and apply them now. Um, we had actually initially a picture in the slide, and we took it out because it's a bit kitschy. But I kind of feel like if you survived that downturn and made it back into this room after 2009, you should all get a T-shirt. It, 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 it was not an easy cycle to make it through. So let's take that same discipline and creativity and put it into the good times as well. And I think if you do that, there's no limit to what the group of people in this room could achieve. And you also talked about strong culture, and culture is a word that we talked about a lot in, in Atlanta at our uh, parts conference, really. Uh, is, there, is there the right culture in finished vehicle logistics? Because I think there needs to be a, a mind shift, a, a change of attitude, a change of culture. Uh, we haven't really got a culture that uh, encourages collaboration. I'm not sure we've really got a culture that encourages innovation. Um, I don't think we've got a, uh, a culture that encourages, you know, sustainability or, you know, or environmental issues. So do you think that there needs to be a big change in the culture, the way we think in, in, um, in finished vehicle logistics, as a just opposed to a business think or, a, or an economic way of looking at things? Louis, I think it sounds like you and I are kindred spirits and that we'd like all of that change to sort of happen immediately and mm -hmm. fully. But the reality is our industry is a lot more like a cruise ship uh, than it is a speedboat. And so I think those kind of turns and adaptations take time. And, and candidly, for us, I don't think on the customer side they get as much credit as they really do sometimes for the true spirit of partnership they bring to the table. Um, you know, we've had a relationship, for example, in Fairfax, Kansas with General Motors for 88 years. I mean, just take a minute and think about that. That's longer than all of our life expectancies, marriages, you know. I mean, this is a big number. It's nine decades. And it's, it's hard for me to believe that that wouldn't exist without a true partnership. And so while I do think that, you know, because of forces sometimes beyond our control, if you look at the rise of the shared economy, um, if you look at the rise of the millennial consumer, I mean, I, I realize, you know, that's something that we're not talking about as much yet at this conference, but my guess is in the next couple of years, you're going to hear the word millennial until you vomit at most of these conferences. It really is changing consumer patterns in the way the cars are bought and thought about. Um, so I think as, as that happens, those forces are going to sort of force us to find creative solutions. And the great thing about finished vehicle logistics, I really can't think of another industry where this is true. We can actually do well by doing good, like by, or we can do good by doing well, depending on how you look at it. Just by doing our jobs better, by eliminating excess trips in our networks, by eliminating empty miles, by paying attention to fuel consumption, we can eliminate emissions, traffic congestion, um, wear and tear on our country's roadways. I mean, we have this phenomenal ability as an industry to actually produce a lot of those social virtues you were talking about simply by doing our jobs really, really well. And I think that that gives us all a unique advantage to make an imprint not just on the automotive industry, but on the culture in North America and particularly in the United States more broadly. Okay. Thank you. A question at the front first here, yeah, and then we'll come there. They're going to hear enough from me, so I'll, I'll avoid saying my name again. But um, question for Brandon, since you're so desperate to talk about the Model 3. <laughs> and do, you, do you think that, that 
Tesla has a chance at, at achieving the sort of numbers that we've kind of seen predicted, given some of the, shall we say, troubles that we've had so far in some launches and, and being behind, I mean, half a million orders or whatever else we're talking about. So is that, is that something, I can't remember the actual, actual numbers you put up there, um, what you're kind of forecasting in the kind of short term on that. Yeah, I, like it's, it's difficult when you enter a new segment, a new sector, right? So it, it's difficult to forecast what actual volume is going to be when it's a new vehicle to any segment, whether it's an electric vehicle or just any other combustion vehicle. Um, I think some of the, the goals that have been stated by some of those companies are going to be difficult to, to achieve. But maybe that's the goal in the first place, right? It's, it's not to necessarily hit some of these targets. It's to, to continue to drive innovation, to continue to get the name out there, to continue to build these vehicles and increase the volume. Uh, we do think there's obviously a future for, uh, for electric vehicles. We do think those lineups will continue to expand. Um, and I think there's a couple wild cards out there. You know, China's a big wild card. At some point, when do you localize production in China of some of these electric vehicles? Um, China has their own domestic electric vehicle companies. There's a couple more that are sort of waiting in the weeds, again, as I mentioned on some of these anti-franchising uh, laws and things like that. So it, I think it will be difficult in the, in the near term, but longer term, um, as again, some of those costs go down, some of the, uh, the build issues start to go away, then I think it will get easier to hit some of those targets. But uh, yeah, the ones that have been stated are, are pretty aggressive. No, you got cut off. Sorry, Chris. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually do have some control over the AV in the back there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick follow-up uh, on the alternative um, fuel, because if we're, or, or let's say fuel emissions, because if we are kind of heading toward a reckoning with these CAF standards in which we don't really, with the trends just moving in opposite directions, what's the reckoning that, that the industry will face? Is it, is it sort of higher fines or other costs that have come in if, if the public just doesn't really want or doesn't move in the direction that the regulations are, are pointing us to go? Yeah, it's, it's essentially one, one of two things will happen, right? Either the OEMs will be forced to stop producing the higher emission vehicles against the will of the public or they will face heavy fines. But I think with the way the new legislation is set up, these aren't slap on the wrist fines. These are pretty heavy handed fines. So um, there's going to have to be some sort of shift. And, and maybe that comes out if there's a spike in oil prices or something like that, which helps that as a catalyst. But it, it is going to be difficult right now because you see the, the industry is headed exactly the opposite way. Even though some of these pickups and SUVs and CUVs are getting more fuel efficient, it's sort of the, the shift or the, the share of those vehicles as the government anticipated they would be as a percentage of total sales isn't anywhere near. If you look at where the initial projections were, um, they had, I forget what the breakdown of cars versus light trucks was, what they expected to be in 2025. We're nowhere near that now. In fact, we're started going in the opposite direction. I think light trucks are somewhere around 60% you know, of the market right now, um, and, and passenger cars are, are only 40%. So there is sort of the, the, the third option, which is they could start to back away from some of those uh, stringent standards. Nobody has said they're going to come out and do that. That might also depend on what, uh, who's in office in, in, uh, in a few months. Um, but I believe one of the next checks is 2021 as sort of the interim standard. So I guess we could discuss that you know, in 2021 and see where we're at. There was a question from over there first, and then we'll come to you. Randy Denton, uh, Mid-Texas International Center. Question for Brandon. There's been a lot of publicity on driverless vehicles. Uh, I assume you all have looked at that to a certain degree. Do you have any projections on what the, um, the applications will be and anything on the timing of when you see it coming, or is it too early in the process to make any kind of projection, even on a general basis? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. It's never too early to throw out a number, as we've seen so many people <laughs> do in the industry. And of course, they're all, they're all over the place, just like electric, you know, electric vehicle forecasts were, were 10 years ago. So we look at it the way that, that NHTSA looks at it, right? There are levels of vehicle autonomy. I think there's, there's four stages, right? Four being fully autonomous. We've started to already see integration of levels one and two, which is semi-autonomous. That's you know park assist, lane departure warning, adaptive cruise control, things like that. Those will become more and more prevalent. Consumers are comfortable with those. Um, we're starting to see those roll out in, in standard vehicles. 
in terms of the level three and four, which are, I think, more what you're getting at, the fully autonomous uh, vehicles, that is a little bit more difficult to predict. I mean, we know there's billions of investment going into that right now. I know back home in Michigan, they're setting up, you know, these test cities. Um, here in California as well, they're setting up all these different infrastructure tests to see how these vehicles will react. So I, I would expect that, that will continue, but in terms of any relevant number of, of, the, of those types of vehicles on the road, I don't see that happening within our forecast window, which again goes out seven years, um, just because there's a lot of issues still to be resolved. And I've always said that with these autonomous vehicles, they can't be 99.9% .9 correct, or the software can't be 99.9% .9 accurate. You know, first time that a vehicle, an autonomous vehicle, you know, kills someone or gets in an accident, we've already started to see some of the headlines that, oh, it was a big deal, like this autonomous vehicle got in an accident and it was its own fault, right? And we're talking millions of lines of code that need to go into these. So there's plenty of work to be done. The industry recognizes that. I personally think it's too early to call out, you know, we're going to see, you know, X percent market penetration by, by this year. Um, because then inevitably five years from now, somebody will go back and be, that guy from PwC said that this was going to be, and I don't want to be that guy, so I'm not, I'm not going to do it. I'll tell you this, though, that um, we're working closely at, in PwC amongst all of our sectors that sort of touch autonomous vehicles, right? So that's automotive, that's technology, that's energy, um, you know, city infrastructure, things like that. All of these are connected, right? And what we've said is that this ecosystem is growing. It's increasingly complex. There's an increasingly number of, of players in this market um, that have an impact. So understanding where you're at in that supply chain and how it impacts others is certainly important. And I think that's step one because this ecosystem, people talk about autonomous cars and things like that, and it's, it's really comprehensive and it's really easy to get confused about how it's going and all the considerations. So we're taking a good look at that and we expect to have some thought leadership out actually later this year. So a little plug for for that. Right, thank Thanks. you. Uh, question there first. At the front, yeah. Name and company name, please, sir. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Al Cardona from uh, BMW China. Uh, question for the lady regarding the uh, potential of these uh, dual use trailers, uh, convertible trailers. Do you think the industry is mature enough to embrace these trailers, or do you think it's only for a niche market? Well, it's a good question. I mean, we are a niche market in terms of car haulers in North America versus broader trucking to begin with. So I think we're about as good a place as any to be the tip of the spear here. Um, in the end, you know, I think there are a lot of presumptions sometimes that go into assessing industrial companies, particularly in the trucking space, um, about a lack of innovation. And, and what we've seen is exactly the opposite. Um, we've seen an absolute deluge of innovation even in the car haul space in the last couple of years and, and even within our own company. Uh, so, so what I think is it is it's not I understand the question, but I don't think it's as big of a gap as you expect. So because of the way finished vehicle logistics works, uh, there are a lot of empty miles in the network. And if you were to go to say a flatbed trailer company and look at empty miles in their network, they wouldn't have it. It's just seen as outright waste and inefficiency, and, and I think there's no reason we, in our space, in the car haul side, can't start to think of it the same way. It's a, it's a better widget, right? I mean, the, the great thing about finished vehicle logistics is it's not going to be obsoleted by technology. I don't think drones are going to be delivering our cars anytime soon. I happen to be on the end of the spectrum that doesn't believe the cars are going to deliver themselves to your house anytime soon. Um, so I, it's not going to go anywhere from a technology perspective. Uh, we're not competing with the Amazons and Walmarts and, and mega retailers. And at the same time, it can't really be outsourced anywhere because you still have to get to the dealership, right? So it's this great business that'll be around, has been around a long time, and I think will be around a long time. But within that space, it doesn't mean the technology and the equipment has to stay static. So I think, you know, what the idea and the advent of potentially multi-purpose trailers does is build in some of that relentless focus on waste and excess elimination. It builds in creativity and flexibility and efficiency in the network. So I think it's a fair question, but my suspicion is this is just a hop, skip, and a jump down the road from what we're already doing. And now that we've actually got it codified into federal law, you know, it's my hope that it makes a very big impact on the network. 
So it's one more, please. Yeah, and then I'm going to ask you a question as well, Al. So, but go okay. On. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this one is for uh, the gentleman. Uh, my question is regarding uh, China versus Mexico. So your presentation was very clear: 51% manufacturing coming within the next few years out of Mexico. Uh, but in due time, uh, from China, the exports are just a matter of time. The quality is outstanding, so they're coming. Do you see a conflict between TPP and NAFTA? Well, could you repeat the last part of the question? Did I hear? A conflict? Yes. Do you see a conflict between TPP and NAFTA? Yes. Uh, no. I mean, you know, the TPP was all centered around Japan, at least from an, an automotive perspective, right? And that was getting rid of the chicken tax, which is the 25% import tariff on on pickups and, and light trucks. Um, I think the the bigger question, to me, anyways, is is I think about some of these global trade agreements. What will, what's the impact of the Brexit, right, with, with Great Britain, and, and what would be the impact of having to renegotiate some of those trade agreements? And then ultimately, and I forget what acronym it is, but the one that's sort of been in the works for the last decade regarding China and any sort of free trade agreement. Um, obviously, the folks that are proponents of NAFTA have come out against TPP for the most part. Obviously, it's a very hot button political issue, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it in the next several months. But um, no, I mean, I don't see a significant impact uh, one way or the other. I mean, NAFTA is NAFTA. It's not going anywhere. Um, Mexico has obviously taken advantage of that. But in terms of the TPP, um, if anything, it's, it's going to have the opposite effect. Because again, we've talked about the yen fluctuation and things like that. So while the initial thought was that, oh, that would help the Japanese OEMs come in and continue to import from Japan, we see now that there's probably going to be more localization than we originally thought as a result of the Forex, regardless of the impact of TPP and removal of some of those tariffs. I mean, we've already seen a couple of the Japanese OEMs announce investment in Mexico uh, to take advantage of that. A question for you, Al. Um, we've talked about, you know, there's going to be stability and perhaps a little bit, bit of a dip in the U.S. Uh, in 2018, but there's growth in the rest of the world. Are there opportunities uh, for North American-based log finished vehicle logistics companies in somewhere like China? And how should they look at how they can uh, work with or in or for China? Uh, actually, that's one of the reasons that, that I'm here. Um, for some of you, I, I lead uh, Finnish vehicle logistics for BMW uh, in China. Uh, there is a regulation coming up uh, basically next month, uh, 1984, is uh, a local regulation that basically says uh, in due time all uh, vehicle holders in China must meet the standard, uh, international standards. So they basically will look the same as our trucks look uh, right here. Today, I'm sure you've seen the pictures uh, over the years, we have uh, trucks that can carry 22 cars, uh, some that can carry 18, and so on and so forth. So the answer is yes. I think it's prime time for companies that are mature and that have the technology and the know-how uh, to uh, invest in China in these particular legal trucks because it's just a matter of two, two years before the regulation is uh, fully enforced. And simply today, there's not enough uh, uh, sources in China that could uh, fulfill those. Okay, thank you. And I should also point out, we mentioned comparing China and Mexico. Tomorrow morning in the Mexico session, there will be a presentation where we try and look at, compare and contrast a little bit on, on Mexico and China. There was a question first uh, at the back, please. Hi, Miguel Reyes uh, with the Port of San Diego. A uh, question from Brandon. Do you have any idea what the import volume will be for 2016 and what that number will be for 2022? Uh, I love pulling numbers out of nowhere. Um, <laughs> let me see. I believe that the not, if we think about non-NAFTA imports into the U.S., yeah, into the U.S., I want to say it's around 2.6, 2.7 million units. Um, that's right around where we've been, right, right around 20% or so of, of the market. Um, if we look at 2022, what we had said before was that in a theoretical scenario, right, with all this import substitution, you could see a reduction of non-NAFTA imports by around 50%.
it probably is not going to be that. You know, we said the imports from China were one consideration, the TPP was another. I think a realistic number is probably around a 30 to 35 percent reduction um, of that 2.6, 2.7 million units of the non-NAFTA imports by 2022. Uh, then there was a question here. I'm Wallace Oyama, Port, Port of Vancouver. Um, I have a question for Brandon. It, uh, it, it's been interesting the last couple of years, especially uh, with the uh, growth, for example, with the uh, light truck sales. And I saw, I've seen that it's caused uh, quite a shift in, um, uh, in supply chain supply chain pattern. As a result, it was a, it was it was a sharp a sharp unexpected growth. Now your now credit to Mexico, they have taken advantage of uh, they've created a lot of free trade agreements that has allowed them to grow their production to be able to supp and to supply all these markets there. But I'm curious. Uh, as to whether there's any risk for Mexico or for any other large production markets that go beyond local demand that will that uh, will lead to sh um, unexpected shifts in supply chains if a uh, market goes down. You see, that, of course, Mexico pre uh, was prepared for a large Brazil contingent, for example, but then you see what happened with the market there. I think last year there was a, some effect about China's uh, we can expect it growth, and I think that create, creates some, dis some shifts there. So I'm curious as far as where you see that p particular possibility of, of sudden expect unexpected production uh, shifts in supply as a result of production not meeting what you know, the market's not meeting what the uh, seeing, seeing production. As, uh, as Ms. Amico said, that's it, uh, the supply chain and the auto industry is like a cruise ship, and I can appreciate that analogy. Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and actually, uh, Chris and I were talking about this last night, and he asked me, well, you know, you're, you're, produ you're forecasting all this growth in, in Mexico, but a lot of that was predicated on, on small car growth. So what happens if we continue to have a, a lull in that, and then to your point about Brazil, which is another big export market for, for Mexico, if that market continues to suffer, where is, you know, what's going to happen, right? Does all this growth still happen? And I pointed out to Chris that we've actually dropped our top line forecast for Mexico by about 200,000 units uh, from a, a year or so ago as a result of that. Um, that there's, we anticipate there's going to be less small car demand, both in the United States as well as Brazil, because that market, as I said, is sort of in a bad place right now. Um, so that's a, that's a big consideration of it that we do, that we do track. Um, but despite that, you still have a really high level of, of utilization. But yeah, you're right, Mexico is at the biggest risk because what's happening, at least with the American automakers, is that they're building their high margin vehicles, their high price vehicles, primarily in the US. So pickups, SUVs, CUVs, and they're shifting production of the small cars down to Mexico to make them more cost competitive. So while there is still some risk there, we still see Mexico as, you know, as a five million plus unit market. Okay, uh, question at the back there, please. Hi, uh, it's Bill from Convertible Trailers, and Sarah, a great presentation. Uh, I love your message. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not referring to the reference, but uh, <laughs> the message of us preparing for future times, for lean times coming, and if anybody in the room thinks they're not coming, I absolutely would, would want them to reconsider their thinking on this. But Sarah, you say it's a hop, skip, and a jump before there's full adoption of this uh, concept, but in that hop, skip, and a jump, what do you think could be done more proactively today in the industry to help move this uh, project forward from your perspective? Well, I think there are a couple of things. Um, the first is we're all going to get a tremendous civic education here with the FAST Act. Just because something has become federal law doesn't mean we've gotten it cleared through the DOTs at the individual state levels. And um, that process is time consuming technical and enormously frustrating for those of you who like a focus on efficiency. Uh, welcome to bureaucracy. So I think as an industry, spending some time on kind of knocking down the governmental barriers, metaphorically, would be great. Um, you know, I would, I would give, for example, in our business, I think the railroads have been very efficient in sort of communicating their messaging at the government level. Um, and arguably, they've been much more so than the trucking side of things have. I, I think the ATA has done um, yeoman's work helping us in the FAST Act at the end of last year. But, but as an industry, we typically just haven't focused as much in that direction um, as, say, for example, our colleagues on the railroad side of things have. 
Um, so first and foremost, I think we need to get fluent in the language of government and, and understanding in the federalist system what that means for us from a regulatory compliance standpoint. Um, secondly, I think we need to think more about collaboration across the industry. Um, there really is, it's not a question of dividing up a pie from my perspective in a zero-sum game. I think we're entering an era where our collective goal should be to grow the size of the pie uh, rather than to sort of fight over some zero-sum game. Um, so I would encourage collaboration, um, both in terms of piloting multipurpose trailer technology, um, in terms of piloting the freight lanes where that's viable and profitable for all involved. And I would also encourage us to engage with customers. You know, there are a lot of inbound parts coming into those plants as well. Um, some of the work that you've done, from my perspective, potentially yields a lot of benefit, not just for the carriers in the room, but for the customer side as well. So really kind of moving our thinking into that 21st century mentality about agile businesses that respond quickly to changes in circumstance that can have a much more just-in-time point of view in terms of customer service, but are also, to Louie's point earlier, truly collaborative at the partnership level with our customers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question at the far side. It would be great if someone can ask the next question right from this far side, just to get my guys <laughs> moving a little bit. <laughs> Good morning. This is uh, Carlos Terron with Trans Development. I'm heavy involved in, in the Mexico market from the infrastructure point of view. It's a question from Brandon. Uh, very interesting uh, graphic of the uh, labor cost per hour between Canada, United <laughs> States, and Mexico. There is a $22, $24 difference between one and the other one. Showing Mexico, I think, at six, $6 an hour versus 20 something. Uh, in your stories, Eventually, that labor market, that labor cost is going to increase. And now with Ford, Toyota, and uh, Kia, uh, some comments that I have received from people there is, you know, uh, they're fighting for some labor pool here and there. So they're taking people from one place to another one. So that increases the labor rate. In your studies, have, do you know what would be the level where Mexico will lose some comp Competitiveness in order to create, you know, this this kind of uh, uh, finished vehicles, and that production could shift somewhere else, such as China. Everybody always wants to know, you know, what's the next low-cost labor market. So, you know, you know, when NAFTA first came on, that it was it was Mexico, and, and everybody flocked to Mexico, and and then it was um, and then it was China, and then it was India, and people are like, what's what's next? Is it somewhere in, in the Middle East and Africa? So. You, you are right. I mean, inevitably, labor costs are going to increase in Mexico because there's a huge demand now for skilled labor, and there's not enough of it. I mean, you have to go through training and, and things like this, and so obviously there's going to be some, some wage wars battled in order to get that limited amount of talent um, from all this new capacity that, that's coming online. So I don't know if there's, I mean, it, every company has their own business case to, to work that out about what is that number. Right? But a lot of that depends on, where, again, where some of these free trade agreements are at. It's the totality of all of those costs, right? So it's not just that fully loaded labor cost. It's a logistics cost that are involved in that, in that decision. And it's different for every, every OEM. I mean, the companies that are importing from China have, have obviously made the, the business decision that it's got to be cheaper, more to our advantage to import it from China than it is to build it in Mexico. Um, so every case is different. I think the type of vehicle, the volume that you're talking about, the logistics cost, the type of agreements that you have in place, you know, the amount of skilled labor that you're able to procure in any of those markets. Um, those are conversations that we do have with, with clients, both OEs and, and suppliers, to work through those, those complicated you know, calculations to figure out what's best for each one. Um, but again, I don't, I don't think it's one number. I think it's different for every company based on those, those variables. I would add to that too, I'm not sure that it's just a question of labor costs that's going to drive the, the sort of relative value of, and competitiveness of the Mexican market. That geographic proximity is still a true gift. And so where I would look in addition to the labor costs, because hopefully they're not going to go 
down significantly right. here too, right, from a just macroeconomic right. perspective, the OEMs might feel differently. But um, I would look at the rail infrastructure, the development of the rail infrastructure there, and I would also look to sort of some of those cross-border trucking regulatory controls. Again, I feel like the theme of my year to a certain extent is regulation. <laughs> so those are the two other things that I would track very closely to sort of assess the relative competitiveness of the market. Thank <laughs> you.